So I go off to the potty and I shut the door, and, you know, lock the door. I couldn't open it. And I'm locked in the loo, which is not unusual for me. I've been there before, <laughs> you know. And uh, anyway, so I'm locked in the loo. And I thought, but they're all having lunch. It'd be awfully inconsiderate to actually... I had my phone with me. I thought it'd be awfully inconsiderate to actually, you know, say David Richardson or Nick Briggs, you know, um, terribly sorry, darling, but to disturb your lunch, could you come get me out the toilet? You know, so I thought, I will give them 20 minutes to Aww. eat their sandwiches. You know, I'm, I'm considerate. Aww. And there was a book in there, and, uh, you know, I thought, well, I could probably give them a bit longer than 20 minutes, really. Um, so, <laughs> so eventually I timed it. And I, I had Tim's number. I just got Tim's number on my speed. So I pressed the button, and he said, where the hell are you? We're all waiting for you, everybody. Say, where the bloody hell's Katie? Where, you know? And I said, I'm locked in the toilet. And he said, well, why didn't you say something? I said, well, because I thought it'd be nice if I let you have lunch first. <laughs> so the next thing I hear, there's Tim Trelaw at the door. Right, right, stand back. <laughs> Boom, you know, <laughs> boom. And I mean, I think, well, Joe, Joe Grant was supposed to be able to pick locks. <laughs> um, anyway, he, he knocked the door down and I looked at him and I said, now you're my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I'm so very physical and this thing, it's like having a leash on. I mean, I can hold this here and it'll, you know, you could project. I just want you to know, I do have a very trained voice. <laughs> a little applause would have been nice. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, 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 I forget. You know how children, and I know I'm far from a child, but um, you know how children do things and they, they don't think somebody is watching me? <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't grown out of that thing that I do something. And then people say, I saw you in the supermarket the other day. You dropped kicked a toilet roll. <laughs> and, you know, and you think, oh, yeah, I did, didn't I? And then I remember once I was doing something and I do end up on the floor for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> Probably because I'm so small, I'm close to it. <laughs> you know. Anyway, and I was like crawling across this stage, and I was having one of those days when I was really a bit bonkers. And uh, the, yeah, the I know. Day ending, <laughs> yeah. <ending> why? <laughs> and um, anyway, and this lovely lady, it was in America, and this lovely lady, she came to me, she said, oh, you're so funny. <laughs> you must have had a few drinks. <laughs> Now, I don't drink. Aren't you relieved? <laughs> um, can you imagine? Uh, anyway, so I said, well, yes, if you count cups of tea, darling. She went, oh, no. Nobody could just behave like you did on tea. <laughs> Hello, welcome to my world. <laughs> Depends on the tea. Yeah, well, yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, it's like with Iris, you know. The wonderful thing about Iris is... You often get her and everybody thinks, oh, Iris is just a, you know, she drinks. And a, but isn't it amazing how it doesn't matter how drunk Iris is, she always just narrows those steely eyes and gets the job done. So I wonder how much she really drinks. That's the thing. You how know? much of it is... is or if she's so pickled show. it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> how much of it is for show and Excuse how much me, of it is actual. actual. Yes, carry on. I'm going to have a drink now. <laughs> as, as a little social <laughs> shipping. Pardon us, pardon us. Is, <laughs> is, 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 is anyone much to join me? <laughs> Do you need a straw? Do you need a tarp? Do you need a... I remember at one of these, some guy had a Tide pen and it was a good thing. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, I remember you giving me those cannolis. Yeah. Oh, God, I love cannolis. I would sit there and use them like they were cigars. Well, I, 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 the first thing I did was try and smoke it. Yeah. And so we called ourselves the Smoking Cannolis. Best girl band ever. ever. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know about you. I, I, maybe I'm sharing too much. But when you have a cannoli, don't you have to lick the cream out the middle? I mean, who can eat the cannoli without actually 
Yeah. That's what she said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so having smoked it, I then sucked the cream out. There are too right. many jokes, none of them clean no, at all. And, and I, <laughs> every single one of them was in my head, yep. and I was being very ladylike. I mean, come on. Uh, yeah, we're just a ladylike. Yep. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> this is what they pay us for, hon. <laughs> oh, I'm just hooked. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll oh. take the bag off, I think. Oh, oh my God, you want to hold that? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I better do that. Right. Okay. Here we go. I right. was wondering, you know, it's a lovely top, but I'm going, that's going to get caught on stuff. Oh, it does. I've been hooked to share. Everybody that's got badges on today, yes, hello, we nearly had to get married. <laughs> I spent about 20 minutes on his epaulette, lovey. <laughs> And I don't know whether you've ever been on an epaulette, but my gosh, it's not half an adventure. It's a new song. I'm hooked on a Katie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. How, where a better place to be? I oh, thank God. <laughs> so I'm fascinated to know, with Iris Wildtime, who I've been doing for so many years, she is now a huge part of me. And I've just done three books... Um, that Paul Myers said only Katie could do 50 voices. And in them, I'm Iris, I'm Panda, I'm uh, wardrobes, evil wardrobes that fly and eat people. Now, I am there doing all the voices, and when you do it, you do it straight from the book. You know, you're not like doing this voice, that voice, and the other voice. Yeah. My favorite, of course, was the depressed vending machine. <laughs> and so when you pick up these books and you look and, you, you know, and I'm just saying, oh, there's that voice of it. And of course, a lot of sort of what I call ordinary people and then people, um, pirates and sea captains and oh, the most, the and then these plastic garbage men and they're all made out of plastic garbage bags. And they have, you know, when you open a tin with a tin opener and it's all jagged, right? And I had to voice that, but they don't actually speak. They just go around going. <laughs> and I'm in the studio and I go. <laughs> and then you're doing the flying wardrobe show. And then right, I did it better than that on the time. Um, and, then, and then in comes Barbara, the depressed vending machine. And Barbara is one of these people that really is so depressed that even her voice is exhausted. Well, of course, doing all this, I suddenly thought, wait a minute, there's three pages of Barbara. And, I mean, who's going to sit there and listen to her telling her life story of all the terrible things that have occurred in her life? You know, and then all this is interrupted by other voices coming in. So you can imagine what I'm like when I leave the studio, can't you? I am not a well woman. No. <laughs> And then you go to you go to do something ordinary like you know, say hello to the man on the tube or something like that, and you go, hello. <laughs> oh, sorry, hello. Because um, uh, there's a lot of those you see. What about those who have to do all that like, like this? And then you're going in and out of these. And I, they, it was it was um, during COVID. And nobody else is going anywhere, me. Um, and so they couldn't give me a director because, you know, and, I, and they couldn't find a studio. So they put me in this studio, which turned out to be a music studio. And uh, anyway, uh, it, the guy who was doing the, you know, the tech was French, didn't speak much English. And I'm in there doing Iris Wild Time, right? <laughs> And every time I walked out, he said, I've never heard anything like it in my life. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's going to go home enough nightmares. <laughs> and this poor man. Anyway, so eventually we were going through this. And then I was coming out and I bumped into Iggy Pop's drummer. Oh, my God. And I thought, never have I done that on a big finish in my life. <laughs> and I had no idea what voice to talk to him in. So she just went, eh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love your work. 
<laughs> Give us a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, can't open her all the way. <laughs> but it was absolutely insane. And, and as I was going through them, and of course, they had, what they do when you do a reading, you know, if you're Derek, so Derek Jacobi, you do your reading. And, you know, so they do it minutes per page, right? Well, of course, when you're doing voices like that, you can't just do it in minutes. So they expected me to do um, over 3,000 pages, 50 voices, and they were counting it as if I was just going to be talking to you. And then Spot the dog found that he had a new friend. Oh, said Spot, how lovely. Should we go and dig up that, you know, that? Uh -huh. No. <laughs> this is Paul Mars. And when I spoke to Paul, I said, what have you, he said, he said, they're the most insane books I've ever written. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> we immediately thought of you. <laughs> and my other favorite story with Iris is, when I did, uh, in the early days, when I did them with um, Colin Baker, and then, oh, I'll get back to how I found her, if you know what I mean, okay. because it's not my fault. Um, <laughs> I take no responsibility okay. for all. Um, anyway, so, um, when I was doing, I worked with Colin Baker, as you know, and we did that wonderful song, which I loved, yes. that tragic song. Um, but when I was working with Peter Davidson, who's a very different sort of fellow, um, and after about 15 minutes, and we're both page throwers, so we're surrounded by pages, right? And, um, oh, there's another story in that too. Hello, um, I have a fire <laughs> <laughs> No, a, I nearly got, I said to Nick Briggs, if, he said, I said, if I can get to the end of this script, right, without <laughs> losing, you know, not being, because there's always me on the floor. Where's the page? <laughs> what, because you've always, here I am on the floor as predicted. I um, <laughs> good job, I can still get up and down, isn't it, really? Way to go. <laughs> um, anyway. Don't so, hurt yourself, honey. <laughs> I'm a woman who's going to tell you three stories in one now. Watch me go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, we, 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 we're page with it. Anyway, I said to Nick one day, I said, if I can get through this whole script, because quite often they say, well, we, we'll leave page three and four and six and eight. So I throw it on the floor. Well, of course, then it's all in this mix. Tim Tr Tr Trelaw is wonderful. He just goes straight to the rescue now. Um, but uh, anyway, so I said to Nick, if I get through... You're jolly well going to direct the next one in your in your shorts, your briefs, your knickers, whatever you want to call them, lovey. <laughs> knickers, where I come from. Yeah. Um, I got to the very last page. I thought I've done it, and Nick's thinking, "Oh, I'm going to have to direct the next one in my knickers." <laughs> the last page was blooming well missing. I was so furious. He palmed it. He yeah, did. yeah, he did. <laughs> anyway, so when I was working with Peter Davidson, we got to about, uh, I don't know, we'd done a, you know, a few pages. And suddenly, he looked up at the director's box. And he said, is she really going to play it like this? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, lovey, she is. So stand back and be prepared. <laughs> I'm sorry, have you met me? <laughs> <laughs> but when I actually got it, I'd just come back from Australia. Now, I didn't know Paul Mars' books. I do everything with Paul Mars now, as you're probably gathering. Um, but I had never, didn't know anything, because in Australia, it's different things, you know. Anyway, so, <laughs> so I come back from Australia, and Gary Russell said to me, I want you to play this character, Iris Wildtime. So I said, oh, great, yeah, terrific. No idea. Anyway, so he says, um, he says now, what I, I said, well, well, what's the character? He said, oh, just do something. I'm always being told that, just do something, <laughs> you know? Anyway, so I looked at the character and it was with, um, it was the first one I did with, it was a Bernice, right? Yeah. And the character starts out in that, so it was before Panda and all that kind of thing. And uh, it says, Iris is outside the convent. Really? Anyway, but I didn't know this, you know. Iris is outside the convent, um, mopping, dewdrops of cabbages. There's an opening for you. Um, mopping dewdrops of cabbages, singing softly to herself. Well, I'd read a few, well, 
I'd read a few pages and I thought, Iris Wildtime doesn't sing softly to herself. <laughs> so it got to that bit and I went, dang, 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 dang. <laughs> and so Iris started to come from that. And then, you know, and then I looked at everyone, because you know when you're doing something and people don't say, yes, that's really good, or yes, that's terrific. Are those real people there? Some of them are. Are they? <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> it's okay, that standing of Fraser that's in the lobby has been freaking me out since I got here. Uh, every time I come around that corner, it's like, man, it's Fraser. <laughs> And it, I fall for it every yeah, single. It's like when the first worked. Well, we weren't really good, but it's, it's like when I first worked in a theatre, and I was very naive. And I was my, it, my first show. Would you believe was in the West End in a two-hander that ran for three years. It's a hell of a learning you for a, somebody who's ever done done television. Anyway, and they said, "Oh well, uh, during the previews, we paper the house." Well, of course, I'm thinking, what? Well, you'd start what, putting up wallpaper? What was going on? I'm on stage, you know. And they said, no, 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 we papered that. And then I had a vision of them actually putting cut-out people in all the seats. So people say, well, we saw the show last night. Full house, you know. Uh, very quiet audience. Um, it's give you something to get used to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so it's Gary Russell's fault, the whole thing. Yeah. And, I, of course, as you know, we've, I've done lots of different irises with lots of different different companions and things like that. And she's probably one of... I love this character so much. I absolutely adore playing her. I really do. Um, I even make her hats now. I've got, oh, wait a minute. There's a blob just walked into the room. <laughs> Okay, it's moving, so that's not a... That's I think a I've thing. fallen in love. <laughs> I think I've met the man of my dreams. Oh, love it, come here and give your auntie out. It's a great <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hello, darling. <laughs> <laughs> One of my only nights, but... <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's lovely. <laughs> Again, too many jokes, none of them clean. Oh, yes, <laughs> quite. <laughs> well, don't forget, I did was the first person to meet Alpha Centauri. <laughs> and I met Alpha Centauri before they decided to put a cloak on it. <laughs> if you like it, then you better put a cloak on it. Mm -hmm. John Pert, we had to explain an awful lot to me, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it's very big, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I'm just babbling. I don't know why. I mean, I should be talking sensibly about things, shouldn't I? About what There's something very important that I need to know. Yes. Barbara the vending machine. Yes. What, was she, what is she vending? What is inside her? Oh, well, she's a very big vending machine. You know, when you, you, you buy... Um, uh, sodas and things like that and and uh, potato chips and that sort of stuff. I'm trying to go from English, which is crisps, crisps and, and pop, okay. oh, which I did. Um, <laughs> so Barbara is providing sustenance and succor for the But nobody wants it because all her soda is flat oh. and all her potato chips have gone soggy oh. and nobody wants anything I have anymore. And she ends up by getting on the bus with Iris and they have to turn her sideways and I have to do this whole scene trying to get a vending machine on a bus, uh, Iris's bus, right? With Panda who's as drunk as a skunk. Um, <laughs> up the front. <laughs> it's, it's so bonkers doing this, you know, and I, 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 I don't know why I got the part. Barbara speaks to me deep in my soul. I mean, really. She did to me. <laughs> and do you know where I got her from? Because you know when, uh, when you're playing characters, you know, I mean, I remember years ago I had to do a hyperactive cotton bud. <laughs> you know, you, you have to see them. You, you know, there is... Although I make lots of jokes about it, and I do do all that. I mean, I did 50 voices in that, 25 in the play I wrote, Not a Well Woman, in including newborn babies crying and things. But you have to see every little thing 
that you're playing has to have a soul because there's no point in you just voicing something. You've got to believe and see that something as a, a walking, talking creature. Do you know what I mean? So I go through the most incredible physical mm -hmm. contortions. Um, you know, there's pictures of me in the studio. And they, you know, everything is moving and twisting and turning. Um, and so when I, I had to think, okay, I had to think of this vending machine. And many years ago, well, I did it here as well at Hampstead. Oh, no, I'm not at home, am I? Where am I? <laughs> Where the freaking hell am I? <laughs> Who let me out? <laughs> Matron swore that I'd have pink custard tonight. I'm going home. Uh, no. The pink pills, Katie, the pink pills. Oh, oh the pink pills, right. The, the shoes. Um, anyway, <laughs> but you, you really, it's, it's very, very hard, but very, every single thing must have a life. It must have a heart. Um, I've been doing this since I was a child. Everything I see, even now, and with my grandchild, everything has a soul. Everything talks. You know, if we bump into a wall, I, I voice the wall. Um, you know, so everything... So when you're doing these characters, if you're listening to them, you need to be able to see them. So it's no good me just doing a voice. You know, I have to be Barbara. Anyway, I did a one-woman show where I played nine characters on stage. Can you hold that for me, yes. darling? Right. <laughs> <laughs> can I drink and talk at the same time? I don't know. Do you think I can? <laughs> <laughs> it's the old ventriloquist. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> Notice oh, how my mouth never moves, almost. <laughs> anyway, so I played, um, I played nine characters on stage. And of course, you don't leave the stage and put on wigs or anything like that, you know. You, you kind of just, one move of the hand. And it was a true story about Betty Davis. And uh, it's called Me and Jezebel, written by an incredible American woman called Elizabeth Fuller. And it was a true story that happened to her when Betty Davis, who, she was a huge fan of Betty Davis's, and she goes to this barbecue, um, and she, meets Elizabeth Fuller, and uh, anyway, so Elizabeth's like, oh, Betty Davis, you know. Anyway, so, um, and at the first thing she says, is the chicken all right, Miss Davis? She said, this chicken is so raw, it nearly pecked me. <laughs> um, so anyway, so long story short, eventually, um, Betty rings about two days later, she says, darling, I wondered if I could come and stay with you for one, maybe two days. By this time, Betty had had, you know, the hip operation. So she's very like this, you know. Um, anyway, so she oh, Miss Davis, yes, of course, you know. Well, she has this little tiny kid called Christopher who's like four. And Betty Davis comes to the house for one, maybe two days. Well, immediately, Elizabeth Fuller's husband just gets Betty. She's trouble. Oh you know, and it's, these are all true stories. Because normally when you see things like this, you see, oh, the arguments between her and Joan Crawford. This really happened. There's a wonderful scene in McDonald's when Christopher has a temper tantrum. And Betty calms him down by telling him how furious she was that an English, English person got the part of Scarlet O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Can you imagine? <laughs> and this kid's like this. Anyway, and then, you know, the kid gets lost on the beach and you get this announcement saying, you know, there's a little boy who's looking for mommy and Betty Davis, you know. And then she, the raspberry patch, and I had to play Betty up that end of the stage, Elizabeth Fuller up that end of the stage, and a dog that was attacking them in between. Oh I am up and down, and anyway, so I'd done this, and I remembered when I was doing this play, and I thought, it's a very, this, this vending machine, has to have this little touch of Betty Davis. Oh, yeah. You know? And, and the little kitty, he got really naughty because he started to swear like Betty Davis. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, that was a character that I took from a real person. But, you, you know, that's why I, 
I love listening. I'm a terrible, terrible, I don't know whether you have the expression here, ear wigger. You know, if I hear people talking, I can be sitting there with you and I can hear them. Mm -hmm. And the voices are going into my head. And, you know, as I say, playing so many creatures and things like that, I have to really color them in for you. I mean, I don't know, do you feel that when you hear what we do? You know, it's like with the Scorchies. Yeah. You know, when I had to do Cool Cat mm -hmm. and I had to sing the song, you know, and I, and it was like, you know, and I decided Cool Cat had to be like this, you know, the real lounge lizard, yeah. you know, kind of Vegas, where I've spent enough time that I should know. <laughs> um, you know, sort of, you know, Joe is making a thing. He's got lights and a flash of go bing, you know. And 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 I get and I get so carried away doing all these voices, you know. I remember my kids used to say to me, Mommy, who are you going to be when you come home today? Oh, my God. <laughs> Trust me, my children are fine. <laughs> Please, I'm sure that, like, their, their stuffed toys all had the best, you know, personalities thanks to you. Well, yeah, yeah my daughter said the other day, she said, Mommy, I'm turning into you now that she's got a child. She said, I was tidying up all the teddy bears and things and the dolls. And I started to say, oh, no, now you get on very well with you, don't you? She said, I'll sit you. And I suddenly thought, I'm turning into my mother. Yeah. My mother. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it is a very, when people say, how do you do? Because I interrupt myself. You know, when I was doing four people in the car, in me and Jezebel, you've got Christopher who's kicking the back of Betty's seat, right? You've got Elizabeth trying to stop him and calm Betty down. You've got Betty sort of, you know, having, and then the husband. And you have to interrupt. So what you have to remember is it, it's not as simple as it seems. I have to understand every single person's emotion, where they're coming from. In my play, Not a Well Woman, I had to know exactly. So one person may be laughing, but the, and then I'm interrupting that person with somebody who's crying. And you have to then, you know, with maybe only three words in between, you've then got to switch back. Now you know why I'm a little bit bonkers. <laughs> because if you think about that, you know, if you're just talking suddenly and then another voice has to clap in and then another one comes in from there. But you have to have, be absolutely, it takes a tremendous amount of, of um, discipline because you have to be on top of every single emotion and voice. So, you know, just to say that, I love doing it, I make light of it, but it's actually um, a very specialized job. This is not something that happens in the editing room in post-production, no. this is all her, y'all. No, 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 no. <laughs> Nothing happens in there except, <laughs> except when I'd done this thing in the, in the, in the uh, studio, yeah. um, uh, which was, as I say, a music studio where all I had was 22 guitars on the wall. They gave me a drum stool as a table and a very rickety place to put my script up, which kept falling on the floor. Oh, good. Um, it did actually, for some reason, when they got them in to edit them, the first editor said, I can't do this. <laughs> because in actual fact, the, the, the sound quality was so bad. So oh, it took a long time to get them out, but they eventually did because one guy said, I'm going to do this. After all she put into this, I'm doing this, you know, and it's now been done. So, and I'm very proud of it, to be honest with you. But yeah, you know, people say to me, because a lot of people when they're doing um, voices for cartoon features, which I've done a huge amount of as well in, in Australia, that was a massive part of my life. Um, when they they often do this voice, then that voice, then in the editing, I'm just about to spill juice all over myself. Um, <laughs> um, in the editing suite, they then put it all together. But you see, Big Finish discovered that how cheap we get Katie. <laughs> we don't need other actors. Yeah. You know? And then of course I played Joe Grant. Well, when I played Joe Grant, John Pertwee said I had a voice that sounded like a long distance lorry driver. And that it was, <laughs> so he wanted me, to, so they all, so I lightened it. Well, now I'm so old, 
I have to go up so many octaves, I need a ladder. Oh dear. And you know, and, and so I'm sort of, that, that's, so, but I've got to find her from the past because I had a different voice back then. Yeah. So I have to, you know, it's, it's all much harder than we think. I'm so pleased when I play Joe Jones. <laughs> I do, oh, thank you. And I'm so pleased when I get to actually voice Iris. But also doing Panda. And because in the books, of course, I have to do everything, so that includes Panda. In the same way as I used to do John Pertwee on all the audios, and the Brig, and the Master, and Joe, and then Paul wrote one where Iris comes in as well. And I had no one else with me. So for, for a long time, I was doing John Pertwee, but not yeah. trying to do an imitation of his voice or an impersonation of his voice, just getting the heart and the feeling, because that's something else you have to remember, that people can do, people say, oh, my friend does the most amazing John Pertwee. What you have to understand, impersonations are fine in shows where you're just doing lots of different characters, like Dead Ringers and things like that. Yeah. But when you have to find the complete, you've got to find the absolute heart and soul, which is more important almost than the voice. Yeah. Do, does that yeah. make sense to you? And Tim and I, you know, I, I never leave the studio when I work with Tim because I always know, I'd say, oh, well, when he says that line, just imagine, because he, he'd do this to Joe. And it just, you know, and it, he's so good because he goes beyond you know, just the voice. It, you actually feel John Pertwee's presence. And we get on so well together. And I knew he was my doctor when I got locked in the toilet and he broke the door down. <laughs> do you want to hear that story? Uh -huh. I mean, you don't have to. Yeah. You do know that I'm the woman you can say, oh, for goodness sake, Katie, get on with it and shut up. <laughs> um, well, what happened? We were in the studio and it, we'd broken for lunch. And I thought, I'll just go potty and then I'll go and join them for lunch, right? So I go off to the potty and I shut the door, and, you know, lock the door. I couldn't open it. And I'm locked in the loo, which is not unusual for me. I've been there before, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I'm locked in the loo. And I thought, but they're all having lunch. It'd be awfully inconsiderate to actually... I had my phone with me. I thought it'd be awfully inconsiderate to actually, you know, say David Richardson or Nick Briggs, you know, um, terribly sorry, darling, but to disturb your lunch, could you come get me out the toilet? You know, so I thought, I will give them 20 minutes to Aww. eat their sandwiches. You know, I'm, I'm considerate. Aww. And there was a book in there, and, uh, you know, I thought, well, I could probably give them a bit longer than 20 minutes, really. Um, so <laughs> So eventually I timed it and I, I had Tim's number. I just got Tim's on my speed. So I pressed the button and he said, where the hell are you? We're all waiting for you. Everybody say, where the bloody hell's Katie? Where, you know? And I said, I'm locked in the toilet. And he said, well, why didn't you say something? I said, well, because I thought it'd be nice if I let you have lunch first. <laughs> so the next thing I hear, there's Tim Trelaw at the door. Right. Right, stand back, <laughs> boom, you know, <laughs> boom. And I mean, I think, well, Joe, Joe Grant was supposed to be able to pick locks. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, he, he knocked the door down and I looked at him and I said, now you're my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Do you have any questions? Do you, have any do you questions? who's got a question? We could sit here and do this forever. I saw you first. Stand up. Okay, it's a thing now. You're making them drop drop stuff. It's contagious. No, it, 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 it keeps you fit. <laughs> this is a safe space. Everybody can feel safe dropping things. I mean, I put a picture of myself outside the, the door today, and I've got this on the floor. I'm trying to hold the door with my bottom. And you know, they're springy, those hotel doors. Anyway. Yes, darling. Um, I was wondering, like, what kind of relationship do you have with John Pertney? Like, was it like a father relationship, like a friend relationship? Like, what kind of relationship do you guys have? You're talking... On screen or off screen? Off screen. <laughs> okay. Well, off screen, we, we instantly bonded. I mean, there was just something, 
You know, when you meet people, you just know. <laughs> yeah, you're one. Um, but on screen, I think the wonderful thing was, you know, in modern times, a lot of younger people say, oh, but he used to be quite, you know, sort of irascible with her at times. And I said, the girl was like 19, just turning 20. She'd done a very meager kind of uh, schooling at, at, at um, what's it called? Unit. Yeah, um, yeah that's the <laughs> one. Um, at Unit. Um, He's 2,000 years old, and she's going, what's that? Why is this? Da, 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 da. You know, and so obviously it, it, we have to look at that rather than the, you know, of course he was a rat occasionally, but he was also absolutely loving towards her. He protected her. They, their friendship grew from her being really irritating, uh, but she was brave. She offered her life for the doctor. That shows you the kind of relationship that, because nobody else had ever, no companion had done that before. Um, and I think there was this wonderful fatherly aspect of he enjoyed teaching her. Because people who ask questions are more intelligent than people who don't, because they want to know. That's why you should always respect it when children keep asking questions, you know? Um, because that means they're intelligent, they want to know. So their relationship grew. As she grew up, their relationship got stronger and stronger. So that was always that thing when she, when she finally, she went with Cliff, as she said, it was the closest person she could find to the doctor. So in other words, had he not been the doctor, etc., I think that she would have fallen madly in love with him. But there was a very, very strong relationship between them. I loved watching her earn his respect. I loved watching that journey. Yeah, happen. yeah. It, 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 was, it was great because to have a character that, as we know in Doctor Who, you don't always see the growth of the yeah. characters. They go in this way, they come out that way. Joe went in naive, over-enthusiastic, Terribly clumsy. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> they got to the point. They got to the point where I used to fall over so many times, and then and then and the camera would say, "Oh, we have to go again." Katie fell over, and the director would say, "Don't worry, she'll get up." Um, <laughs> you know, um, because it it all added to the. Because when you create a character, once again, you cannot have a one-dimensional character. Well, you can, but. You need to have all the dimensions of that character, all the dimensions of that relationship. And you watch Joe just getting more and more kind of growing up, understanding, learning, starting to think for herself when she totally turned around and go, no. Or, you know, as soon as she was told to do something, you knew she wasn't going to do it. You knew she was going to, don't go out there, Joe. Mm. Uh, but, you know, so it was a very interesting character to play. And I think for a lot of years, uh, in the early days, it was misunderstood. And they thought, oh, you know, I screamed less than a lot of the girls that came after me. Joe didn't scream that much. Princess Josephine was not having it at no. a certain point. And she had uh -huh. a few little, you know... Along the way, there was a few people that would have quite happily um, married her, but she wasn't yeah. having that. No, she didn't take any nonsense. No, not having it. And look what she did with the master. You got me once. You ain't ever doing that again. Mm -hmm. And he, she won his respect. So there was a time when people say, oh, she just runs around, you know, um, she's not very clever, and she wears short skirt. You know, no. Don't be judgmental. <laughs> you in know, the 70s, everybody wore short skirts. You know, exactly. <laughs> she was a girl of that time with her clothing, right? But she was very much a strong woman. And I believe that to this day, um, that she was a very, very strong woman. Amen. You know? Over there. Yeah, and you can't have a companion that's too intelligent, otherwise you've, you've got nowhere to go. Yeah. 
You know, you've got two people who know the answer. Well, you know, it's like I always say to people in a relationship, if, we, if you agree with your partner all the time, one of you isn't necessary. <laughs> Be with smart people who disagree with you. Yeah. And, you know, so, yeah, absolutely. I, I think we have to look at it now, you know, with, with less sort of judgmentalness and less of this sort of, oh, well, you know, I like that one because she's smarter. Or I like that one. You know, just accept that everybody does a wonderful job in the same way as every actor that plays the doctor does, brings their own creativity, their own imagination. And as I once said to somebody... It, that's what the two hearts are. It's the heart of the actor and the heart of the character. Oh, I love that. You know, so that's how I feel it. I love that. Edwin. Um, yeah, I, I was raised on John as my daughter and he was my companion. And uh, when I got the big finish stories with you and Tim and later when John Culture was the brigadier, I just went ear to ear because it's like you shut your eyes, you put it on, and it's like 97. It's vital, yeah, because when they said to me, you know, would I do it? Um, because, and I, and the moment that I met Tim, and we, we just honestly hit it off straight away, we, we are very naughty together. <laughs> and there are a few conventions, so we'll say, those two shouldn't be allowed on stage together. However, no. um, <laughs> but John and I had that sort of, and that's the most important thing. You've got to feel the relationships. You know, I think that's really, really important to me. You've got to feel those relationships. Uh, mind you, it is a little odd when I'm playing Joe Grant because Tim's, what, 39? Oh, bless. John Coleshaw's, yeah. whatever. And I'm there and I'm 76 playing 19. Get it. Get it. No. Um, <laughs> Why am I listening to you? <laughs> I just suddenly felt, uh, because I've gone deaf in one ear, I thought this might help. <laughs> it might. <laughs> yeah, I wrote that, like, pre orders for a new box set, and it said it's the last one of you playing Joe. Is that true? It's called The Return of Joe Jones. I think so, and it said it's no. the last one. No. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> this was the very. <laughs> Well, this was the one where, because you, what you've done too, which we haven't mentioned, is Joe starts out as this, if you look, there isn't any other character that has aged right the way through to 50 years with all these children, great-grandchildren, and then has the loss of her husband to deal with. Um, no, it's not the last one. Are you, you were saying Joe Grant or Joe Jones? Well, I don't know. Where did you read it? I think it was like we came up with pre-order on that website or something, and I got worried you weren't doing No, it's, it's called The Return of Joe, if that's the one. And Joe Grant, no, I know I'm doing another one. But maybe it is the last one. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Start writing letters. No, don't we can't me. have that. <laughs> we can't have that at all. Over there, yeah. What was it like in that incredible scene in Power of the Doctor, getting together with all the other companions? Oh, darling, we've been together as friends and everything. I mean, there, there was nothing new to us because we all do conventions together. Um, and, you know, we have, I have very close friendships with an awful lot of them way outside of Doctor Who, um, you know, and, uh, and I'm now, you know, very close to Sadie and Daisy. I've just done something with both of them. Um, you have to remember, when you do all these conventions together, we're all buddies. You can see how we all work together at a convention. That, that's friendship. Um, the moment... Oh, it's all right. Um, I, I taught a whole <laughs> art therapy class today, and nobody mentioned that my fly was undone oh, during dear. the whole... <laughs> I mean, what kind of therapy is that? 
what's trying to escape? <laughs> sorry, and I just had this awful vision of my fly being open again. Um, anyway, sorry, I got distracted by my fly. Um, <laughs> but so those friendships are already in place. Uh, you know, and I've worked with wonderful William Russell because I was in love with him, not through Doctor Who, but through Ivanhoe when I was a little girl. I, I was madly, and I told him how in love I was with him. And we went to Germany together. I know his lovely wife. We all know it. I babysat um, Nicola's dogs for a weekend. I love those dogs. Yeah, I do I love too. Those dogs. You know, so we have, we are bonded. And we are, you know, and what's interesting is like, you know, um, some of the new people, I remember when Alex Kingston, I was doing a convention, they said, oh, Alex so wants to meet you. You were her, you know, her oh. favorite. So you, you realize that, you know, it's like when you're talking to Russell T and Russell T says, you know, he said, and I suddenly think, oh, wait a minute, this is Russell. And he, he said, no, I'm a fanboy because I was his era, as was Mark Gatiss and so on. So we're all absolutely one wonderful family. And I think that's why, you know, you all are the best fans in the Doctor Who fans in the, in the whole world. And I can't tell you enough and often enough how much this means to me because that's the best thing to come out of Doctor Who. But also, I think you feel that we're all a family coming to visit you, you know. We have time for one more, so it's going to be you. Yeah. What, me? Make it a good one. <laughs> I don't want to... No pressure, but make it a good one. I want to go to the toilet. <laughs> She's going to lock herself in, though, and someone's going to have to kick the door down. <laughs> I'm going to have to confess something. I was living in Australia and in the States when all of the, you know, the convention started and all of the 80s began. Um, and uh, I didn't see any of it. And the second part of that is it's on a screen, which I'm hard pushed to see as well. Um, so I've actually had to learn and because I love everybody that, that's involved, it's been great for me because I've watched as bits and pieces as much as I can. I've worked on audio with quite a few of you know, the, the doctors, as we all know, including Tom Baker. Um, but so for me, I'm actually seeing all this with virtually no knowledge at all. I mean, I've been friendly with Nicola for ages, and it took. And before I saw she went off with Brian Blessed, I didn't know. <laughs> and I just said, "That's an interesting choice." Um, <laughs> no, but I say this. With, so for me, I have to learn all those years because when I was in Australia, I wasn't working. Nothing to do with Doctor Who at all. Nobody cared, and it wasn't. You know, so I was working constantly as an actress and all sorts of things. I had my own chat show. I, you know, I did so many plays and cartoons and things like that. So, but I wasn't getting to see Doctor Who because it wasn't on every Saturday as it jolly well ought to be. So there. <laughs> you know, it's like, do you know something that really gets up my nose, apart from this now, um, is, I, is the fact that everybody I've just got attached myself to myself. I was, you know, was gonna say chain chain links and this top. Um, well, um, this was given to me as Matt Smith's bow tie, and I said, oh. and I said, well, I'm not gonna wear it round my neck, am I? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I'm still detaching myself. I'll be with you in a minute. Um, I can talk and detach myself. Uh, there we go. Um, and I said, but I'll wear it round. So I said, have you got a bit more chain link? So I wear Matt there. <laughs> um, no, you, you asked me a sensible question and I didn't answer you, did I? <laughs> did you ask me a sensible question? I hope so, oh, I hope so too. 
Oh, that's right. Yeah, I know exactly where I am. Yes, I, I, I detoured for a minute. Um, but yeah, I, so I've actually started to learn everybody and really appreciate it because I'd never seen, you know, all the, the Janet and, you know, when we had like a lot of people in the TARDIS back then. Um, and I really enjoy learning all that time that I missed. No, the thing I really like is the one thing that I will always do, this is just my way of doing it, I never read reviews before I go to the theater. Because the moment someone gives you their opinion, and that's all it is, an opinion isn't a fact, they give you an opinion, it's in, subliminally in your brain. So when you go, something in there has already got an expectation or something. Now, the great thing for me is like being the child, when the curtain goes up and you have no idea what's behind it, what's going to happen. And so when people, I'm constantly getting tweets about, oh, you know, are you going to watch it? Oh, it's going to be, oh they're going to show you a bit of that. No, I'm not going to do anything until I'm sitting on that sofa in front of a television screen, not in a pub with a massive great screen and everybody having a lovely, and I'm just going to let it happen. And I'm not going to have any opinions. I'm not going to have anything. And I've never been let down yet. That's... I love that. Guys, go by Katie's table. Give her love. Get a photo op. Do the things. Have an amazing con. Give love to Katie freaking Manning. How much do we love this woman? This is Erica Harlicker Stone, and you're watching a Fandom Spotlight. Yay! Make sure to like and subscribe. Do it. Do it right now. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. I don't know why you aren't doing it. Seriously, I'm going to keep saying it until you do it. Ugh. Okay, thank you. Yay! Remember to have fun and follow your fandom. Bye!